Hey guys, you're listening to Way Out Radio. How are you doing today? Uh, you're listening to the best punk and ska and reggae tunes around that you know is right here on Way Out Radio. Catch us at wayoutradio.com. So today we've got an incredible indie musician with us. We welcome to the show Niall Marr, who entered the indie scene in 2016, front in the band Man Made. Recently he released his debut solo album, Are You Happy Now?, He's also toured extensively with German film composer Hans Zimmer and Niall's dad is Johnny Marr of the Smiths. Niall has contributed to two of his dad's solo records on guitar and backing vocals for Messenger and Playland. How you doing, Niall? I'm all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, thanks. Thanks for having me on. Is that all about right? <laughs> I think so. I mean, we're missing a few. I've been in a lot of bands. <laughs> yeah, man. <laughs> I try to like cut it down a bit, but it's hard to cut, you know. But this is the thing: I've been in a lot of bands, not for most of them, not for that long, you know. But yeah, no, fair enough. I mean, you've got the highlight reel. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just like a few name drops, Hans Zimmer, there get it go. in there. That's a so... big, it's a heavy name drop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, clang. So, <laughs> with your um, was I right about like your contributing to two of your dad's albums? Like, was it guitar and backing vocals, or did you do anything else? No, I think, because we're going back a bit, like, because um, those records, I think, were done, um, from what I remember, they were done when uh, we had a studio in the house I grew up in as a kid. And my yeah, dad we're going to get those, into that. <laughs> yeah, my, my dad made those records there. And basically my job, and this is kind of funny that it's it's kind of full come full circle because it's actually what I do for hands um stuff and when i have to do um work on movies but my basically i get called where they go we need someone to make weird noises can you and and it's basically i'm the like weird noises guy and my dad (laughs) it was the same where like i think the amount of stuff that i've where he'd have been working on things as a kid and he's like no can you just come in and make like a load of loops and like backwards stuff and i I was like yeah because it's basically just become what it is i do so i've got like the like indie thing that you know my like indie playing that's just my go-to that i I do but then i've got this whole whole other thing that's just been from being a kid i guess i've always been obsessed with like weird backwards noises and but make them all with guitar so on those records i think it was like from what i remember it being like I'd just come in from school or something and my dad would be like, Niall, uh, can you just come in and just put some weird noises on? I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. It's like that um, that Beatles tune, A Day in the Life, where they've got like those backwards kind of squeak sounds that are a oh, bit like yeah. people were saying for ages, is it like seagulls or is it like guitar backwards? And it, if you listen to it now, it's like amazing because it come out in the 60s, but it sounds like it could be a Chemical Brothers tune. Yeah, it's like, right. I love old tunes like that. Are you into your like 60s music and stuff? You know what? No, my like, oh, I was never really. I've never been like a super sixty said. Obviously, you love the Beatles. You know, like you have your musical education, like starting. But for me, it was mostly um, that like American late eighties, nineties guitar stuff. So it's like Fugazi, you know, and like yeah. everything <laughs> in and around that that then spawned from that. You know, it's like Fugazi built to spill, all of that kind of stuff. That's what I'm really, really like honed in on that. That's my whole, that's my whole jam, you know? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So what are some of your like favorite punk songs and uh, bands? I mean, do you prefer the, the US side of punk or the UK side? I mean, we were talking about, you know, we just mentioned the Buzzcocks just before I think we started this and obviously, you, like that's one of the cool things I think about. Um, I actually really, really like about Manchester. Even when you've travelled all over the world and come back, when you kind of everyone in the city knows who the Buzzcocks are. I'm like, that's really, really cool. You know, that's yeah. a fucking great thing. Obviously, like the Buzzcocks, really like the Clash. Um, but for me, it was American stuff that obviously all of them. They were trying to sound like English bands anyway, which is always kind of funny to me. But it's like the argument is my favorite Fugazi album because it's the weirdest one. I think it's just like so cool. But I anything Fugazi have done, I'm like this. This is great. There's no bad tune. I really, really, really like Hot Snakes. That yeah. Because um, for me, 
I, like, I'm my favorite kind of guitar playing is like rhythm guitar playing of any kind. You know, I'm not like a shreddy dude. Um, yeah, I love that. Basically, the entire band are playing rhythm guitar. And, yeah, and, and like every time I've seen them play, I'm just like, this is one of the most amazing things I can get out of a gig. Um, <laughs> and then you know, I, I got really into this this band. Um, it was this Australian band that called Sharpie Crows. And they're like, they were this, I mean, they're just like a new birthday party. I don't think they're still going, but they made a couple of records that I was just like, on a few tours I've gotten really, really into. And I was like, yeah, this is, this is it, you know? Yeah. Yeah, no, definitely. That's wicked, man. So like you're named after Nile Rogers, which is pretty crazy. I mean, yeah. um, tell us, like, are you a fan of Nile? Did you get into him as you got older or? Yeah, so I think um, the first song, like, I ever heard, you know, we were talking, like, brought in the hospital, like, born song, was, <laughs> I, I think Space Surf by Sheila and B Devotion, which is a Nile Rogers tune. Cool. Um, so it's been, like, you know, I was brought up in, like, a disco house, obviously, because it's, like, we well, named after him, and that kind of chord change and that rhythm guitar playing, it's, like, full... It's the first thing being brought up in a house that really, really like values rhythm guitar. That that's the yeah. whole thing. It's like, and um, so yeah, big, big Nile Rogers house. And then um, he finds it really, really amusing that I'm named after him. Like he really is. He's, whenever we've kind of, you know, like whenever we've been doing stuff where we're together, you know, um, and he's always like, "Hey Nile, what do you think of Nile?" Like he's, he's always. <laughs> in it. Um, and then whenever he plays in Manchester or, or a gig we're at or something, he always makes a very, very big deal about being like, oh, when I die, Niall can take over. So then there's always a Niall in Sheik. <laughs> Please don't make me take over Sheik, obviously. <laughs> but no, you can't not, like, it, I think it's impossible for a human being, even whether they know Niall Rogers or not, to, like, you'll like one of his songs. You know what I mean? Yeah. The man's done so many. I know, right? Yeah. And yeah. I didn't realise until, like, Bernard Sumner, because I know he's a friend of... Is he a friend of you? He's a friend of your dad's. He goes, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, they've yeah, been yeah. sailing and stuff, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, but I read his book, and he was talking about how the progression from Joy Division to New Order was loads of touring in the States, and how them going to the disco clubs, like, in New York, was massively influencing uh, their music. And then Factory Re Factory, like, the club in Manchester. So... I didn't realise that there was such a strong connection from like the New York disco scene to Manchester, which then spawned like this wave of indie bands that also had this like rave appeal. Yeah, it's a funny one, isn't it? I mean, but but that's the thing, like, like to go slightly veering off, you go, I really like, like, I was always a Blur fan and I really, really like Graham Coxon's guitar playing. And Graham Coxon is just trying to be like Stephen Maltmus and he was getting into <laughs> Fugazi and it's stuff and it's like it's just so funny that they're all kind of crossing you know and I know like Maltmus yeah. would have still would have been trying to do like some you know English 60s thing and then you, it's just it is really really funny the way that kind of American and England influ band influence works. Yeah, definitely. Um, so I wanted to ask you a bit about like you were growing up in such a musical household. There was a lot of people coming and going with the studio. So what instrument drew you in first? I mean, did you like pick up the guitar pretty young or was it like harmonica or anything you can remember? What's kind of funny um, being around like because we grew up in like a functioning studio, you know, and yeah. and, and then it was always there was like you know there it was there was always adults around like um who were like serious about being creative you know whether or not they were like big successful artists or not they were like lifers and so the funny thing that i that i sort of i didn't this wasn't a conscious thing but you realize how to take being like an artist really seriously um whether or not you're a, you know you're, you're a success with it or not um because i was around people that were you, you didn't, if you put records on it, it was like you're engaging with it. it. Music wasn't just like a background thing. It's like I grew up in a house where it's like adults listening to tunes, talking about tunes all the time. And yeah. then because um, obviously we had guitars around the house, I didn't think I started 
like playing guitar really or like really paying attention to the guitar till I was like 13. But then my parents moved house and obviously I, like when I was helping clear out the house and stuff, you go through all these, like you see all these old photos and from being a little, I'm talking real little kid, I'm always like engaged with the guitar and not just in a just, oh, it's this object way. It's like, I guess it was always a thing that I was like into um, yeah. without me necessarily realizing I was taking it very seriously. Um, so I guess it's just always been, it's like always been there, you know, so you kind of can't not interact with it. Yeah, definitely. That's a massive difference because when I was a kid, growing up I always loved music and it just sounded like magical to me like this huge wall of sound hitting you when you listen to a track that you like but you couldn't I didn't really understand like or have any access to like how I could ever create something like that and then I had this teacher at school who had said to me now just sit down and listen like intently and figure out what the instruments are and then focus in on the bass and hear like what that's doing and then focus in on the guitar and like that gave me so much more accessibility to realize I oh it's not as amazingly complicated as I thought like there's just yeah, this right. loop here there's that loop there and then it gives you those building blocks those moments are really I think they're really important and like that's the thing I I realized I was being taught because I couldn't look at um, a like Dutch painting, you know, classical Dutch <laughs> painting, and explain what's going on, you know, <laughs> yeah. because I'm not, I don't know how to take in that media, whereas music is so accessible for a lot of people that, that you can immediately have a response to it, and there isn't a lot of, like, intellectual stumbling blocks, but then when you want to really deeply engage, you do have to kind of learn certain, I'm not saying rules, but you need to learn how to absorb what you're taking in. I remember the first, I still really remember the first time I saw, the first time I really, really, it, the penny dropped where there was a seven inch and it was that track Dream On by Aerosmith. Yeah. And I remember that seven inch, I was like watching seven inch get put on. I, and honestly, I must've been like five, you know what I mean? Uh, Cause I just I remember being like, this is spinning round. This needle goes on sound comes out right and it's like the chord change you know and then I'm, I'm getting explained it's like yeah no but this chord change and it goes like this and da 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 where I remember for hours being like this track this object this needle then speakers it, you know yeah that's one of the things I think is where I'm like I've been really lucky that I grew up in a house like that where it was like oh right that was just around you know I didn't have to seek out like music you know you know what I mean whereas I know a lot of people it was a foreign thing they had to be introduced from outside you know yeah man no, definitely and speaking of records I've got something here oh yeah yeah man let's talk about one. this so first of all tell us a bit about the badge that comes with it oh it's good isn't it so this yeah. is my Ooh. friend Dan um my friend Dan Wilson did the artwork he was in that band Black Wire um who were really good um and this was one of the ones where me and him were just like on a real, we were on a mission with it. And he just came up with all these really, really cool ideas. And yeah, and it's come together in this like really amazing, like neat package. Yeah, man, it's really beautiful record. Like you don't get many like this. No. <laughs> and you know, like you said before that it was never about money. It was just about beautiful packaging and art and just doing it right you know which isn't something yeah. you often get to do is it no and and you know what as well I don't blame people for not doing it you know where I'm just like you do whatever you need to get through whatever you're trying to do but for this one we put out so many seven inches and this right from the off was always it was just a don't give us you know the label stay free we're like we we just want to put something out from you it doesn't have to like you can do whatever you want and yeah. I truly could have given them something like just you know like me banging on a load of pots and pans and they'd have put it out um, <laughs> and which I was like this is so cool but so I, I used it as an opportunity to to go well I'll do something I wouldn't necessarily do and rope in people that I've been wanting an excuse to to like do something with and this just became the excuse 
you know, so it was like, let's just make music for music's sake and make this one thing that exists right now and then won't ever exist anymore. Yeah, definitely. So you got the A side and the B side there, Plastic Valves for an Open Heart and then the Thunderbird Show Band. So yeah. those are pretty uh, psychedelic names. <laughs> I suppose, yeah. <laughs> so- I mean, it was like the first... I wrote the B side first because I had this music where I had gotten back into. Uh, we just finished. I just finished writing my like next album, a bunch of tunes, and we built a studio in lockdown. Uh, me and a buddy um, in this old like abandoned mill, and we, I mean, we were like we literally like built the walls. You know, like it was just this abandoned section. Did all the wiring. It was like put electricity in. We still don't have running water, but we're like fine, whatever. Wow. <laughs> um, but, and then we just finished the record, you know, where we'd obviously been taking everything really seriously. And, and I was like, right, let me just make a load, go, go back to how I used to make music. And I was like, I'll make a load of tape loops with old cassettes. I got people to send me in from Instagram. I was just like, please just give me a load of old cassettes because shops weren't open or anything. And yeah. then cut them up and then made a load of loops and then started playing piano because I was like, I'm done with playing guitar for a bit. I've just made a record. And then used it as an excuse to involve my friend who's just got an amazing speaking voice and I knew he'd write something really good. Um, and so he, he just like went out for a walk, uh, you know, out, out by his like front porch in the mountains in, in the States and then gave me this amazing little like story about the Thunderbird show band. And then I was like, <laughs> right, let's put it together. And then I kind of felt guilty that we needed a like pop song, <laughs> something slightly more pop. Uh, so it wasn't just we weren't asking too much of people to buy it and so I was like right let me just write and play the A side and we just pretty much did everything through in one take me you know me and the drummer and it was like right here we go done excellent no that's really cool man it's a wicked uh, wicked release and definitely like sought after so I'm really proud that I've got one I was like yes get in there it's just nice to do something that doesn't have to be towards any goal other than you just made something really cool you know? yeah yeah exactly no definitely it's like your I was gonna say it's like your blue Monday where they they cut a <laughs> something in the, the cover so they lost money on every release yours wasn't that bad you made a bit of money but <laughs> it's just out there man it's just awesome and yeah, don't ask any questions <laughs> if it was my blue Monday I'd be absolutely living it large <laughs> <laughs> um so yeah you just mentioned about your own record label so like Oldham Street Records is it yeah yeah so you're trying to give manchester bands more of a chance and you mentioned before like the london centric industry is is just like reaccumulating whereas it used to be a bit more spread out tell, tell me about that i think it goes in waves because you know and bear in mind like i'm i'm not here to shit on the london scene or oh, sorry just swore again um, I'm, not <laughs> here, right. I'm, I'm not here to like you know jump on the tear london. it down nile yeah yeah exactly <laughs> And um, but, you know, because I joined like for a while, Manchester music scene completely ended when I like in that post Oasis hangover, the six <laughs> centre scene was just awful. And that's what like I grew up into. It was just like dodgy promoters running pay to play things, really? fans that would fans that could never break through it, and and because no one was looking and then everyone moved to Leeds and like. It, and that was an amazing scene for ages. And I was like, that, yeah. that's brilliant. You know, when the Broodnell started to just like flourish. And then uh, and then with Manchester bands, um, then Manchester kind of started to come back a bit and we started to get more of a scene building up. And we had a fresh, like enthusiastic batch of promoters doing cool stuff and we had the space for it. But what I was seeing was we had all these bands that were, that were good like good enough that if they were in london they'd have been given some money to do something whether or not they would have succeeded i was like beside the point but they'd have gotten a shot at something and so me and a friend set up uh oldham street records because we were like right at some point we have to be the older people i want to say older i mean like by like three years or what have you so we've just had three more years of like getting your stuff together or like we've accumulated three more years worth of touring gear or microphones you know and we just thought right at some point we need to be the ones that are saying 
let's actually help yeah you know rather than just like complain and so we set it up to put out um my music because it was like right we're in a pandemic what we're we doing let's just put an album out on our own label and then because we built the studio it was like right let's use this as an opportunity for bands we like and think deserve a shot that just because they're in Manchester or like another small, smaller northern town, they will never get to go in a studio. They they won't have someone bother to spend time on them. That's yeah. the thing. And we were like, what we can give, we can't give like financial aid. <laughs> we can't <laughs> give like a lot of stuff that other established labels can do. But what we will give you is time, you know, and that's what I looked back on that I was um, lucky enough to be given by so many adults when I was a teenager who were really, really cool, even though I wasn't very good. They were like, I'm going to put on this kid because he's serious. He might not be very good, but he's serious. And yeah. we were just like, well, let's be that person then. Like, because yeah. if, if someone, someone has to continue to be that person, otherwise those people stop, they stop being around, you know. Yeah, definitely. And like I, I worked as a TA in a school for a bit, like when I was out of uni and mm -hmm. um, there was just no bands like in amongst the students. Yeah. And as a secondary school, like being in a secondary school, like I just expected that, like because yeah, when right. I was a kid, everyone was down the skate park and everyone was in a band. Like it was just what we did. And so to see that massive shift and also with like all the youth clubs shutting down, you're just kind of like, well, no wonder like crime's on the rise. It's like nobody's doing anything fun anymore. Like you just need to like encourage like young people to just do something creative, don't you? Even though you're only yeah, like 100%. 28 yourself. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, I mean, it, it was just, it was just more so that like, I really kind of wanted, um, we built a studio. We just thought we need, you know, because we you never know the, with the way cities are going, particularly Manchester, you don't know how long these spaces are going to exist. So what yeah. I was, was like, let's just make music like we're on a deadline, you know? Yeah. And and if we come away from it, and you know what, no one got anywhere, but like six records were made by people who wouldn't have ever gotten to make a record, I'm like that's yeah. good enough for me, you know? Yeah. Like, yeah, definitely. And that working to a deadline is so important because there's so many uh, bands, like if you read anyone's autobiography that you you admire their music, then they're just like, we wrote this album or we were in the studio for a week or two weeks or three weeks. So just thinking to yourself, like, imagine if I just intently tried for two or three weeks, like I'm going to come out with something, you know? Yeah. And, and also you don't have the luxury of like, you know, we recorded all these bands um over lockdowns and we've just been like well i'll produce you but i'm doing my own stuff as well and we've got and it was more so like i'm like it was like right niall's got three weeks we're doing it you know like i'll come after and watch you practice and then we'll work that out and then come in and it's like those days of just swanning about in a studio it's an indulgence that people just can't afford anymore maybe some people can but not yeah. afford you know yeah no definitely um okay so i wanted to ask you a bit about this playlist that you made a few months ago so it was like girls to the front playlist on spotify oh right yeah 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 Yeah, and obviously like for the listeners who might not know you you must know if you listen to this show but bikini kill were the band that used to say girls to the front and um and kathleen hannah was kind of like the the originator of that whole thing of just like you know not having women be invisible in rock music so yeah tell me about like your playlist well right so going back a, going back a little I have been again consider myself really lucky that I've been a lot uh there's on quite a few occasions the only like dude in a lot of girl bands okay um, and I was in like a like lesbian like art rock band in Leeds for a bit um, Amazing. And I, was, and I was the only guy. And I'm talking when I was like, they were older than me. And I was this like 16, 17 year old. And, and I learned so much being around that. And obviously being obsessed with American bands like Bikini Kill, 
I mean, it really, Bikini Kill was, I remember like we made a record with one of the, um, with the guy who made those Riot Girl albums. So we made one album together and, and I remember, so everyone else in the band like had an apartment and I had, the guy was like, oh, there wasn't enough room for, for me to stay in there. And he was just like, you can sleep here in the studio it's in a garage, you know, and he was just like, I'll get you an airbed and what have you. And what he'd do, he just brought like a stack of CDs every day and was just like, because once we leave the studio, the garage is locked. So you're stuck inside. And yeah. so he was just like, here's all this music. I'm like, all these bands I like. I remember the first time I heard um, Bikini Kills in accordance to natural law, which is 30 seconds long. And it literally has the best chord chain it's got like a great top line riff the words are amazing and it gets better in 30 seconds i'm like it's the perfect song and i it actually brought me to tears when i heard it it was so yeah. seminal i was like i can't believe what i just heard but so <laughs> i was um so I, I learned a lot from being a guy in a girl band there and then i was also in an american uh girl band as well um and I learned so much from just being exposed to the kind of stuff that like women when they're on stage have to deal with. And like when you're the only guy in the operation as well, like people would just come up to you and they're like dudes in venues are like talking to me. And I'm like, I am literally the least important member of the band here. Like you just <laughs> brush past like four members of the band to, yeah. to ask me stuff. And I was like, you know, come on. And then just like the lechy stuff that they'd have to deal with. And so, and then I, 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 um, I text for war paint, you know, like in their early days when it was just me and the girls when I was like a kid, which was really funny, which was a real, yeah. I, another real eye opener. <laughs> and I did that for like two years or something. And so I learned a lot. And then back going to this playlist, I made, um, I wanted to do this really long running playlist, but I wanted it to alternate between female artists and male artists. Cause I'm like, it's a practice for me. I'll get to learn about loads more um, girl bands that I wouldn't have come across without just calling back on the like obvious go-tos of the blondies and you know, um, yeah. I was like, it has to be 50, 50. And then, so I did that, that playlist was running for years and then I was people had been asking me I just want the girls for ages so I was like right on International Women's Day I was like this is the time I need to go through and separate all these amazing like female artists that I really like and just put it up there and people have people really really responded well to it and I was like this is this is a cool thing you know yeah no oh, that's wicked man that was really cool it's cool to see that and um yeah i know what you mean about uh bikini kill i mean i watched the documentary where she was married to a beastie boy and he he went out for the day and left her with a, his four track and when he came home she'd written that la tigra um yeah. decepticon and he was just like what the fuck like, he yeah. was like that's so amazing no. <laughs> he's um, an absolute all of, all of them in Bikini Kill are really good. Like, they're really, really talented at what they do. You know, you're just like, this is so, so rad. Yeah. Um, and they just, but it's like, from what I've seen, it's so, like, in Manchester, we used to always, um, obviously, pre-pandemic, we'd always make sure um, we'd have female artists on the bill with us. Because yeah. I'm like, well, okay, you know what? Use my name to let's fill let's fill a gig on my bill. You don't have any pressure to bring anyone down because it's gonna be uh, it's gonna be a full crowd. My audience are really really nice. Like, there's no <laughs> laddie vibe. There's no macho stuff. Like, we spent years, you know, with my previous band, Man Made, where we'd all I was wearing a gold sequin jacket and we were all like glittered up. Yeah, and, and like paint nails bunch of long hairs and we did it to specifically go against these dude these indie dude bills that were just bullshit <laughs> where you're watching dudes be really average night after night you know on these small little bills yeah and we'd come on and we're like 
everything about the way we look says we are not part of your thing and, yeah. I, and we were so into it and then and that's really led me to have what I think is a really fantastic like audience particularly in Manchester because it's like people that got it they were like we are not seeing a bunch of lads yes they may be a bunch of dudes on stage but the vibe is different and that's when we like we always make sure we have female artists on because the the stumbling blocks that I've seen from working with girl bands that are just at every level I was just like some again someone needs to be that dude to go well hang on here you go here's a bill like hey, do this you know like come show them how good you like come show them how good you are we have a better time anyway because no one likes it when it's just a room full of dudes anyway you know what I mean <laughs> yeah um, it is crazy because you you think with like say a hundred years of rock and roll we've seen the blues ballads we've seen like the mur the murder ballads of the blues musicians we've seen David Bowie we've seen cross dressing we've seen demonic stuff and we've seen you know Alice Cooper kill himself on stage and we're at a point where it's like what is shocking and it's still shocking for a man to wear sequins for some reason like <laughs> you know what what makes me laugh and I love that like younger kids are doing this like. Um, not adhering to gender norms in clothing. I'm like, super cool. Love that you're getting points for it. I just want to point out, I did it <laughs> for years and got the shit kicked out of me. Like yeah. we'd play gigs and it was like, we'd, we'd have people fighting us on stage. Like some gigs where the audience were trying to fight us on stage. We were having stuff thrown at us. And I was like, at no point did I get like, you know, like, eschewing gender norms props because we yeah about that we were just like this is gonna this is gonna be fun yeah and we play some towns where you're like uh oh and my mates would be like gnarly you're putting on the sequins i'm like i've got <laughs> who haven't i <laughs> yeah. it's incredible yeah no you got to uh I don't know. You, it's just crazy that that's challenging for people well, so. and, and look at those festival lineups that have just come out that it's like it's 2004 again. I know, yeah. It's just all lad rock. Yeah. And you're like, come on, man. I know. Yeah, I couldn't believe, heavy. like, I was seeing Foo Fighters headline Reading Festival last year because I was just like, yeah, they're good. But, like, really, 20 years down the line? Really? I, I, I mean, <laughs> that's not even my biggest one. It's just when you use, like, I think Liam Kendall Gallagher. Pauling was, like, a, a shock where you just, like, there's not a single woman here like that sucks yeah know? like get it together come on you know yeah definitely all right i'm, I'm gonna move on because we've got a little bit more to get through but you mentioned man made so they were a trio and yeah. um you had your debut lp tv broke my brain back in 2016 and um so that was four or five years ago now and originally that album took about eight years worth of songwriting onto the onto the record so yeah I mean like t just take us back to that time like that record it was basically like I'd written a bunch of songs this was like from me learning to write songs and then yeah and I used to play um solo as well so it was just me because it was easy to get gigs because I'd show up and I'd, I'd show up dead early to show to venues like the brood now and people like Nath, who runs the Brood Nell, would go, this kid keeps turning up and keeps bugging me. What, is it <laughs> just him? Yeah, let's just let him go on first as doors open. And I'd be like, let me play 20 minutes. All my stuff's in my car. I can <laughs> carry it all in in one trip. Like, guitar, <laughs> little amp, pedals, in. And, yeah. and I'd played, and because I, I was just like learning to be on stage and learning to, to perform. And, and, and then when we got slightly, you know, I got a bit older and then it was like, okay, we need a band, you know, because the songs are written for a band anyway. And then it was basically just, even before we made that record, all that Man Made were about was just touring. And we put on our own shows that were like art shows in the day. So people would come and we did everything so more people would come. So we'd be like, let's involve more people. So more people have skin in the game. So we will eventually get to play to more people. 
so we'd we'd really be like oh we couldn't get a gig in this so we'd be like oh we can't get a gig in this town and we were like okay let's book our own and let's like involve a load of students and then they'll come and see us you know um yes people, you just didn't you didn't have that and then it was like i bought a van um and then it was literally just we just lapped around the country i mean for one point i think one year we played Inverness more than any English band. We just, like we would literally just go all the way around, and because by the time we got to the top, it'd be okay. We'd have it taken us long enough to come back down south, and then we just keep lapping. And so yeah. Man-Made was just like indie trio covered in glitter the whole time, just <laughs> playing everywhere. And we we even used to put it out to house parties where we'd be like we'll just turn up at your house and we'll just play, you know, and we, did that. and we did that for a while and it was, it was great. And it was what happens when you're young, you know, and you can just go, we, all we care about is like playing live. That's it. Yeah. yeah. No, it's incredible, man. So like from there to now, you've got your, your own debut solo album out. Are you happy now? Came out in November. Um, and it's like dedicated to the people of Manchester. Does that like tie in with your new label as well? I think you know you know what that was it was like i'd man made finished because we kind of burnt everyone out like that kind of <laughs> really? like, we kind of burnt each other out and stop playing my house party man kind of. <laughs> no i'm joking like, it was like stop turning up here no but it was like you, you know we we never took a break and we just played and it was like sleeping on everyone's floors you know and and it just became this point we were like right it, this is just exhausting and it was when we were going to make a second man made album and then i got the call to be in hans's band so then that was like that took over a year of my life where i'd gone from touring in man made to a full year on tour with hans um you know and it was just constant and then what i found when i've been touring a bunch of these other places i'm like people all over the world music fans know manchester and i'm like this is a small this is a small town grand scheme of things like a small place on a small island in the northern hemisphere and people all over the world are so attached to this idea of what it is i'm like so many other places don't have that and i just you just take it for granted because you grew up here you know and and I was like, wow, okay, that, that's amazing, you know, and then, and then we moved, I, and then I lived in the States for a little bit, because after the hands tour, on, and I was like, okay, um, I stayed in the States, just because I, I was like, right, uh, and then we made the conscious decision to move back, and, um, and be like, we are going to write the solo, I'm going to write the solo record, and we'll do the, get the band going, and so it was like, write the solo record, come back, and it was just all written underneath this club. And because I don't drink, it's yeah. just Manchester night out. And what I'd do, because it gave me an excuse to see some people out, but then be like, I'm just going to go work, you know? So I didn't have to kind of hang around with everyone boozing and like off the reds and stuff, which <laughs> I, I, I enjoy, but to a, like, I enjoy no being point. around. I know exactly what you mean. <laughs> you know? And then, but so I ended up writing all these songs coming back for the first time in my life making a conscious decision to move back to Manchester where I was like all of a sudden all the stuff that's objectively kind of shit about it you know <laughs> I didn't weigh on me so much and I was only just enjoying the bits that make Manchester really special and it's always the people yeah. um, you know and and so I, I basically wrote this album with like a club above me and I'm in this basement room and there's all these people, you know, that are like upstairs, like dancing, you know, there's people breaking up with each other. There's people like getting off with each other. There's it's that <laughs> whole thing. And I was just like, so into, um, I just was like, you know what? All these people are really, really special, whether or not they, they know they're special. Yeah. You know? And, um, <laughs> and then it was like, right. Album's done. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> amazing amazing man I, I just wanted to ask you a little bit about like because your dad did a book a little while ago so set the boy free johnny ma i had a little recap of the bit about you uh, earlier that's really sweet have you read the book i've like so we were around i've read most of the book because this is the other <laughs> thing is like we were there through the whole writing process uh, so, so it was annoying like, i feel like the bits that no, there was just like the bits that I didn't, I haven't read. I know because yeah, it was getting written, but it is funny. I mean, it has been a while since I've read it, admittedly. Yeah, I just wanted to say like it's quite unusual in the rock and roll story that you know he met your mom as a teenager and they and they've been together this whole time and they're real like soulmates. I mean, do you, what what's that like? I mean, do you? It's just like this is the thing. It, it's like having um. Just it goes back to what we were talking about first, where it was just having supportive parents. Yeah. Um, where genuinely, I could have, you know, my sister's not involved in music, you know, yeah. and like she's been supported. Um, where it was just the thing that I had going for for me was a set of two like very working class parents that managed to come up through making music and then therefore it was like the kind of it was like very very bohemian upbringing the fact that it was like well all these adults live with us all the time like various people in various bands and that's normal to me and it was always encouraged to do things that I think other people would consider unusual but for me it was like like if I was writing songs or like trying to play guitar or something, you know, or like working on my like little four track, um, I worked out pretty pretty early on that I wouldn't get asked to do my homework. <laughs> so I was like, I'll write songs because I won't get asked to do the schoolwork. And my parents are <laughs> like, oh, he's still yeah. doing some. If I was just sitting watching TV, I'd be like, what? Yeah, do you something. Know? Like, what are you doing? You've got school. Yeah, um, but, he sees you with the guitar. He's like, "That's my boy." <laughs> well, it was just like, oh, "Okay, there, there you go." You know, but I think the, the 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 big thing is like is having parents that it being a being creative wasn't weird. That's yeah. the thing which so yeah. many people have as an initial obstacle. You know, um, yeah, where it's like, and and now I think we've almost come too. We've got not too far, you know, but we've almost come <laughs> all the way around where it's now you've got all these like music colleges um, to study how to be in a band and you learn like media training and all these things. And I'm like, that's because now parents see it as almost a viable career choice almost, which I'm like, yeah. this is, it's, we've gone so far the other end. It's kind of very, very weird. It is yeah. weird. And then when you realize like if you do a degree in music, you would actually be better off just, touring for those three years and releasing records to be honest that's what i've learned <laughs> the, amount of, the amount of people that since we built a studio that have come through where we've gone like yeah what do you want to hang out for a day like watch us how we make records we've got a band in you know i mean it's been a little yeah. difficult with the pandemic and stuff but like um the amount of people that are sitting there going we didn't learn any of this like <laughs> i'm like yeah i mean what are you learning you know what i mean it's like yeah. it's like okay I'm sure there's like definitely there'll be valuable stuff, you know. But like I've done talk, I've done like um, like guest lectures at music colleges and stuff, and I'm just like, right. The day, the biggest thing for me is just because you study music doesn't mean you're a musician, because every day you're not doing, you're not making music, you're not, you weren't a musician that day, and that's the trick I think, is being how to be a creative in whatever field you want to do is think of it like that, where you're like, I wasn't a musician today. You don't have to be a musician every day, but, yeah. but don't just think because you're, you, you're thinking of it, you're being a musician, but it's like, just choose to, or, you know, or a painter or a photographer or something. If you didn't, you weren't a musician that day. You weren't a musician that day, you know? Yeah, exactly. I dated, the brother of um this guy who was in the body rockers and he wrote the song like 
I like the way you move, which is like a massive dance here ages yeah. ago. And I was just like, what's the difference between you and your brother? Because your brother's like a massively famous, like successful guy. It's like gold records everywhere. And you're like a talented musician, but like you haven't done anything. And he's like, my dad kicked him out when he was 16. So he had to make it. And I was yeah, like, right. whoa, that's really powerful. So a few days ago, you started rehearsing rehearsals with your band again um, for the first time in like a whole year. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah so yeah. what are you guys, what's happening and what are you working towards at the moment and how are the, the songs coming along? Um, well, we basically like we we've, we've got a finished album um, that is now just like the follow up solo album. And then, wow. um, and obviously because of the pandemic and stuff, the way I wrote and recorded it is different. You know, we built a new studio. It, it was very much a, like, I'll play everything. And then the drummer comes in and then he plays and we're like, hey, we've got like six songs. Do you want to hear them? And he's like, yeah, okay. And then he just plays. And then I'm like, right, leave. You know, and then me and my mate had like uh, engineer it and, and do all that. And so... I wrote all these songs during the pandemic without really thinking of, I'm going to have to play them. And then I also learned from being in other bands, we did not need to rehearse all through the pandemic because we didn't have anything to rehearse for. And you would have, we would have hated each other by the end of it, you know? Mm. Um, <laughs> so it's kind of refreshing to come back after a year and be like, Oh, okay. Everyone kind of still sounds the same. I was expecting, usually in my head, whenever you've not played, I'm always like, we're going to suck. And it'll be fine because you know you can get better, but you sound like a school band. Um, but thankfully, we kind of, everyone just sort of slotted back into to how they sound and learning the new songs is fun because they feel very different because I've written them in a very, very different way. And we're all a bit older and trying to you know it's it just the it's easier it's like we're settling in um, but we're basically trying before everything opens up we've got uh we're gonna do a live show that's all filmed and put out the new songs you know obviously and a bunch of old ones but we're gonna basically record the gig in the studio so we're playing it in the studio film it properly record it mix it as like a live album you know um and then put that out in some capacity as like a well you get to learn all the songs that you would have heard us play all last year as we were writing them but you didn't get to hear it so now here's your chance to, to hear it before you necessarily like we start thinking about putting out a record you know i just thought it was cool and before gigs start taking over as well you know just a, a last little here's your chance to be patrons of the arts you know amazing yeah definitely now it's really cool that you've like built your studio through lockdown and you've kept the work ethic and you've helped other bands like what more can you ask from a pandemic for a year man that's crazy that's what I mean. I'm trying. <laughs> like all i can say is i've been trying <laughs> all right i'm gonna let you go i'm just gonna end on one little folk story which i really like and i want to share with the listeners so as we've mentioned throughout the interview um niall has had like a state-of-the-art studio in his house growing up bernard sumner of joy division recorded like the england a little bit of the england football anthem world in motion at their house and uh as a kid when niall was young like he loved the song there she goes by the lars <laughs> yep. and the singer lee was at your house and he just performed it to you as a, when you're a little kid like as if he was in a stadium of 20,000 people <laughs> when you say performed shouted it at full volume <laughs> at uh, an infant you know like at a toddler <laughs> sitting down and but apparently like apparently Lee was just I mean also we're in the full throngs of heroin addiction as well so we've got wow. this we've got this you know we've got this like scouse smackhead coming in <laughs> Who still as that Lars record is still I think kind of unbeatable for like English albums. It's yeah. just so it, it's so good. And at points, you know, from what I've seen of footage where you're like, man, they were kind of untouchable. And I so I'm not sure if this was current I'm not sure what level of smack involvement this was, but apparently he's always been that intense. 
where <laughs> he's just if he's going to do something he's going to do it all in so it was like i think my dad was like oh yeah now really really loves there she goes and he just was like right guitar on one two three and just and he the man sings loud when you <laughs> look at all that last footage you're just like man some of those tv performances you're like there's no mics there he's just he's just belting it so i think his whole vibe is like if you're gonna do something go all in yeah definitely amazing man thank you and um i mean i'm gonna tell everyone to go out and get the new album are you happy now and um, what else is there anything else special bits of merch that you want people to like check out well i'll tell you what if you just like i'm pretty active on instagram you might get yeah. kind of annoyed by the end of it but <laughs> um if you want to be involved just follow us on instagram um we've got loads of stuff up on Bandcamp. um I think there are a couple of that like really, really rare, beautiful seven inch that are still available at Stay Free. And we've got, uh, <laughs> we'll have new music. Like there's going to be new music coming out like quite soon. Wicked. So it's just going to be like, follow us on Instagram and you'll find out. You know? Excellent, man. Thank you so much, Anne. It was really cool to talk to you. Thanks so much. Hey guys, DJ Paul of Frost here from Way Out Radio, the one and only punk and reggae station broadcasting every week. Go to wayoutradio.com for more. So I just want to tell you guys about the brand new fan club we've just launched. It's absolutely amazing. You can choose from contributing £5, £10 or £20 per month to keep the station alive, pay our guests handsomely and keep music money in the musician's pocket and in the punk world and in the reggae world. So find out more about that at wayoutradio.com. Thank you very much.